Good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending where in the world you are. Uh, thank you for joining us for um, this webinar today about uh, the really exciting Open edX conference that was held last week, last month at Stanford University. Um, today, uh, Appsimilar founder and CEO Nate Ani is going to be talking about, about that for 15 minutes or so, and then we're going to take questions from people. There's, of course, uh, so many great sessions at the conference, we're not going to be able to, to cover even a small part of it. Uh, so feel free to ask questions in the question uh, panel of GoToWebinar, and uh, we'll get to as many of those as we can after uh, Nate's finished with his presentation. Of course, this is just part of a uh, series of webinars that we do um, almost every month. The Eucalyptus, uh, the next release of Open edX Eucalyptus is coming out uh, in a few weeks. And so our next webinar is going to be about the new features of Eucalyptus, and we're going to do that in September. So you're going to be getting information about that um, in a few weeks. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Nate and uh, let him start telling us about the Open edX conference. Great. Thanks, Louis. Um, great to see everyone on the call today. Um, we've got a great uh, lineup here for you in the next 15 minutes. Uh, obviously, as Louis said, we can't cover everything that happened at the conference because there was a lot of really great stuff. Um, but we've picked out some highlights that we that we've heard from from folks are are sort of top of mind. Um, so we want to cover those today. Um, I'm going to go over a brief intro to who is AppSembler, um, what is OpenEdX. Uh, we're going to talk about OpenEdX for corporate learning, which was a big theme at this year's conference. Um, there's a new version of edX Insights coming out with Per Learner Analytics, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, there's also a new uh, mobile app for iOS and Android that's coming out. It has a lot of new features. And then, um, as Louis said, the Eucalyptus release is just around the corner, so we're going to highlight um, some of the new features from that. And then uh, at the end, we'll, we'll uh, have some questions. So a little bit about AppSembler. Uh, we're a leading open edX solutions provider, uh, which means that we provide customization, implementation, hosting, and support around the open edX platform. Um, we've also been a sponsor of the last three open edX conferences. Um, we also are headquartered just down the road from the edX office. Uh, so we participate in a lot of hack days and um, oftentimes meet with the, the edX team to talk about you know, product direction and strategy. Um, and there's, uh, there's a list of some of the customers we've been working with over the last three years. So what is OpenEdX? Uh, OpenEdX is a free and open source course management system that you can use to author and deliver online courses. And the platform today is used all over the world to deliver engaging learning experiences. So um, this was a slide that was shown at the conference um, of just the breadth and scope of where OpenEdX is being used all around the world. You can see there's uh, sites in Indonesia and in China and in uh, the Middle East and Japan and just all over the place. And, there, you know, the slide wasn't big enough to fit all the logos on here. But this gives you some sense of, you know, how uh, OpenEdX is um, expanding throughout the world and a lot of people are adopting it and, and using it as their, their preferred online learning platform. This is another slide that was shown at the uh, opening session, uh, showing the growth of OpenEdX since it was released a few years ago. Um, actually, this is only going back to the first of 2015, but you can see just in the last um, year or so, um, it's been really steady growth um, up to, I guess, around 300 um, sites worldwide and um, just about 4,000 courses. Um, which represents a 77 increase, 77 percent increase since uh, October last year in the number of sites, and a 105 percent increase since October 2015. Um, so, if you look at the number of learners who are actually using Open edX, you take the 8 million on edX.org, and then you add approximately five and a half million uh, Open edX learners. There are more than 13 and a half million learners around the world who are using the Open edX platform on a day-to-day -day basis. So. I, I think that's pretty impressive growth just in the last few years since the Open edX platform has been released. So those are just a few numbers to kind of give you a sense of um, the growth of the platform. Um, one of the big themes uh, this year was corporate learning. Um, as you all know, Open edX came out of academia, um, being built by Harvard and MIT, but it's increasingly being adopted by major corporations 
um, as well as you know smaller, medium-sized businesses. And so one of the things that we wanted to do at the conference was provide a forum where we could have a discussion about some of the challenges that um, companies are facing when they're trying to adopt OpenEdX and what are some of the unique solutions that people have come up with. So I hosted a panel discussion um, and had six really great panelists. Um, some of them are our customers and some of them are uh, you know, from McKinsey Academy and Microsoft, um, really talking about how they've, you know, their experience and their story taking the platform and making it work uh, in a corporate learning environment. So some of the things that we touched on were um, the need for better reporting, uh, interoperability between different systems, uh, creating learning paths or learning tracks for students, um, and virtual labs, being able to, to provide you know, hands-on environments for students to do exercises. Um, so this is Doug Foster from InterSystems, who, uh, whose slide is up on the screen, highlighting some of the things that, that InterSystems is doing with OpenEdX. Um, they've been one of our longtime customers, and, and they're doing some really unique things around microsites and around uh, connecting OpenEdX with, with other systems that they use internally. Um, so after that panel, we, we split off to what, what are called the birds of a feather session, uh, which is a little bit more informal kind of round table. And in the room were folks from many top com companies such as Microsoft, IBM, Cloudera, McKinsey, who are all using open edX to deliver online courses in the corporate environment. And as we went around the circle, um, it was clear that people were facing many of the same challenges and some of uh, some had come up with some solutions to overcome those challenges. But the question remained, well, how do we share these solutions with each other? There's, there, there's not really a forum for um, people from companies who've adopted OpenX. So we scratched their heads a little bit and um, came up with the idea of creating a corporate working group, um, which is now on the official OpenEdX wiki under the working groups page. So there's now a corporate learning working group um, that has a mailing list, it has a Slack channel, um, and it has a wiki page where the goal is to create an inventory of all the enhancements, customizations, integrations that various companies have done to make OpenEdX work for them. Uh, with the idea being that companies can not reinvent the wheel and they can kind of look on that wiki page and see, oh, McKinsey already built that feature that we need, so let's Let's uh, come together and and try to collaborate versus everyone kind of going off on their own and and creating a siloed working environment. Um, so being open source, there's an opportunity to um, to come together and and have shared development projects. Um, you know, where where companies who've who've uh, enhanced open edX or have built an integration can contribute that back to the community, and the other companies can take that and and uh, improve it. So that was really exciting um, to have that as an outcome. Um, I, I felt a lot of um, goodwill and camaraderie from that session that people finally felt like, hey, now we have a voice. There's, there's a place for us to, to come together and talk about some of our challenges. So stay tuned. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the mailing list is still very new, so there's not a whole lot of activity on there. But we're going to be making a big push um, you know, over the next few weeks to get people on board and make sure that everyone knows about it. Um, so there were a lot of other really great talks. Um, I can't highlight all of them here, but these are a few that that I thought were worth highlighting around corporate learning. So there, there's a company called Applied Materials. They're a semiconductor company, um, and they they gave a, a full featured talk um, called "Lessons Learned and Discussions for the Future of Open edX in the Enterprise," which is a really great talk. Um, I highly recommend checking that one out. And then they gave two smaller lightning talks, analyzing effectiveness of online training in the enterprise and securing open edX for the enterprise. Um, so if those are challenges that you're facing, I recommend checking those talks out. Um, IBM um, talked about their big data university, uh, where they're educating 1 million data scientists with open edX. Um, and they're, they're actually migrating from a Moodle platform that they've been using for the last few years. Um, and they're now uh, relaunching their site using open edX. Um, moving away from Moodle. Um, as I mentioned, Doug Foster from InterSystems uh, gave a lightning talk about building a best-of-breed learning stack with Tatara LTI and OpenEdX. So really 
interesting use case of uh, taking the content that is in the Open edX courses and embedding that content in a third-party external LMS using LTI, um, which was something that Harvard spearheaded for their use of Canvas on campus to take courses that are in Open edX and embed the content from those courses in their Canvas um, LMS system that they're using on campus. Uh, Aquient, uh, our friends over at the, the gymnasium, gave a talk about Open edX Slack and Intercom. Um, so Slack and Intercom are two third-party tools that can help with messaging and communicating uh, to your students and providing support to them. Um, so that's a really interesting talk as well. And then uh, the last two I want to feature are both talks that I gave. One is on uh, Open edX and interoperability, getting Open edX to play nicely with others. Um, so I basically did a survey of all the different types of integrations that we've done for various customers, integrating edX with Salesforce and um, with Marketo and single sign-on and uh, using the enrollment API to programmatically enroll students in courses. Uh, so if, if those things are of interest to you, I highly recommend you check that talk out. And then I gave a, a shorter long, uh, lightning talk on getting your SCORM content into Open edX. Um, that has been something that uh, a lot of people have have been interested in over the last couple years or so, and we're very pleased to have announced our SCORM X block at the conference, which now allows you to take your SCORM content that you've created with Adobe Captivate or Camtasia or Articulate Storyline and pull that SCORM content into Open edX um, just by uploading a zip file. So um, that was the corporate learning. Um, one of the things that came out of the, the birds of a feather session is that the existing reporting capabilities provided by OpenEdX are lacking. And the next version of edX Insights, um, which is the analytics platform that edX offers, um, promises to improve the reporting. So I want to talk a little bit about what those improvements are. So Gabe Mully, uh, he's on the edX Insights team at edX, gave a really great talk um, about Kind of the motivation for building edX insights and what were the problems that they were trying to solve um, at uh, edX.org you know more at the MOOC scale so not necessarily solving the, the problems of, of companies who want to get very specific information about um, employees or customers who are taking courses but they were initially solving the problem of how do you look at learner engagement you know in, in courses that have 50,000 100,000 students um, but they realized that that's not enough. And so if you look at the new dashboard, um, who are my students? What are my students doing in my course? How are my students doing on course assignments? Down below, you'll see what are individual learners doing? So they have now added a new feature that allows you to look at specific learners and identify um, what they're doing in the course. Um, are there at-risk students? Are there students who are particularly excelling? And so this is what it, it looks like. Um, you have your learners, and for each learner, you can see how many problems they tried, um, how many problems they got correct, how many videos they've watched, how many attempts per problem, and if they've been participating in the discussion forums. And then you can click on any, any of those individual learners, and it gives you a little graph of their activity over time. So you can kind of see, oh, this week they were not very active, and then this week they became more active. So... <clears throat> I'm cribbing some some slides from Gabe's talk. Um, hope he doesn't mind. So really what they're trying to do with Insights is, one, provide um, a platform that allows you to observe what the students are doing. Um, the second is being able to interpret um, from that data um, some, some behaviors that you want to track. And then lastly, once you have uh, the data and you've interpreted it, then you can act on it. You can actually make changes to your course to improve it, or you can you can um, identify students who are maybe falling behind and need need help. So if we take Gabe here, um, you know, looks like he's tried a lot of problems, um, but he hasn't watched any of the video content. So that might that might inform you, like, well, maybe maybe the videos are are not doing what we think they're doing. <laughs> um, he also hasn't particip participated in the discussion forums. Um, so that might be an indication to reach out to Gabe and find out, hey, what's going on? You know, you haven't watched any videos, you haven't, you haven't participated in the discussions. Um, okay, so that's learning analytics. Um, mobile apps is another thing that's getting a, a huge boost um, in the 2.0 version of the iOS and Android apps. Um, there's now the ability to create learning profiles or learner profiles. 
um, right within the, the mobile app. Um, you can also now participate in the discussion forums right from the mobile app. You can also um, search through the course catalog and actually enroll in courses right from the mobile app. And uh, push notifications are, are also going to be there. So you can actually message your students wherever they are, um, reminding them, hey, you started taking this course, you might want to come back and continue that lesson that you left off on. Um, one thing that's not on this slide that I'll mention is, um, for those of you who don't know, the, the original mobile apps were basically like a glorified video locker. So you could um, download videos for offline use and watch them, but that was pretty much all you could all you could do with the mobile app. Um, that capability still exists with the 2.0 version. You can still download the videos for offline playback, but they've now introduced the, the ability for students to actually do assessments right on their phone. So they can they can do you know uh, checklist problems, multiple choice problems, even drag and drop problems. Not all of the uh, problem types are mobile ready, so that's something to be aware of if you're building a course and you want it to be mobile ready. You should look on the edX documentation to make sure that the, the problem types that you're using are in fact mobile ready. So Eucalyptus. Um, Eucalyptus is just around the corner. It's scheduled to be released um, mid-August and um, there's a lot of new things that are coming with Eucalyptus. So I'm not going to have time to go, go through all of them. Um, as Louis said, in September we're going to do a deep dive of Eucalyptus once it's been officially released and, and, sh and talk a lot more about it. But I just want to give you you all a kind of a sneak peek of what's coming. So one of the things that they've done is they've they've taken the, the OpenX platform, which is very large and um, you know there's a lot of moving parts, and they've started taking some of those parts and moving them out as separate services. So there's now a course catalog service, a program service, and a credential service. And what this allows you to do is essentially integrate with these services um, from other systems you might be using. So for example, edX.org some of you may not know this, is actually a Drupal site. It's not it's not the open edX platform. So when you go to edX.org and you're browsing through those courses, that's actually um, edX, uh, that's actually a Drupal site that's that's showing all those courses. But what's cool is they've now split out the catalog that used to be embedded in the open edX platform. They split that out as a separate service. So you can now query the course catalog from any other system, including Drupal. Um, and then the open edX site can also query that service to render the search results in the course catalog page. Um, so that just makes it much easier to take the courses that are in open edX and display them on other systems that you might be using. Um, the program service is what's powering X series. So this is the ability to bundle courses together in a learning path. So that's being also being split out as a separate service, which means you can, you can offer a, a bundle of courses, um, if, you, if you're selling your courses, for example, instead of just selling each individual course, you can sell uh, an entire program, uh, like, a, like a bunch of mini courses. Um, and students, when they, when they buy that, they're essentially being enrolled in you know, six courses that they're supposed to go through in some sequential order. Um, the credential service is also now available uh, for issuing certificates and badges. Um, so if you want to extend that, it's now a lot easier to extend it. Um, a few other things, uh, account settings for students to change their account settings. There's now multi-site theming support and coupon codes. So you can also um, offer discounts for certain users when they sign up and, and buy a course. Um, on the teaching and learning side, um, one of the complaints that people had is when, when you first go to the course, it would always put the student on the announcements page and for self-paced courses, there weren't, there wasn't a whole lot to announce because it wasn't a timed course. So they've now changed that. The default now takes the student right to the course outline and they can get into the materials right away. And there's no confusion about, well, where should I go to actually access the course? Um, they've now added a feature. Uh, Eucalyptus will have a feature for students to create bookmarks. So as they're going through the course, if they, they see a particular piece of content that they want to bookmark and come back to later. Um, there's a, a button they can click and then you can sort of track all of your bookmarks in a central place on your dashboard. Um, there's now the ability to create teams and these are sort of um, self-organizing teams um, where the, the instructor can set up the teams in advance and then students can kind of um, come together um, to work on things, uh, you know, small projects or discussion topics of interest. Um, so this is different from cohorts, uh, and that cohorts are, are typically assigned by the instructor, whereas teams are, are more um, students themselves organizing. 
uh, student notes allows you to essentially like highlight. If, if you're a student and you have a, a paper textbook and you have a highlighter and you're highlighting text, you can basically do that digitally within your course. So any text on the, on the screen, you can just click and drag, highlight it, and then add an annotation to that text. And similar to the bookmarks, you can go to your, your notes page and you can see all the notes that you've taken across all of the different courses you're taking and click quickly jump on any note and it'll take you right back to that spot in the course. Um, the, the video can now have closed captions if you want to do that instead of the interactive transcripts. Um, the open response assessment problem type now allows um, students to upload assignments into Open edX for staff grading purposes. So you can upload PDF files or audio files or video or uh, Word docs um, and you can specify what types of things can get uploaded. And because Open edX is increasingly being used for self-paced courses uh, as opposed to timed courses, there's now a, a course pacing option to make it really easy for course authors to just designate this is a self-paced course, and then that shows up in the course catalog as a self-paced course, so you don't have to do any, any uh, funny stuff in advanced settings to indicate that it's a self-paced course. And with that, um, I want to just remind everyone that our next webinar is going to be in September, not August, as it says on the slide. <laughs> um, we're going to take a break in August since a lot of people are on vacation. Um, and that also gives us some time to, to really dig in and, um, and get a closer look at eucalyptus. I um, also want to mention that you can watch all of our past webinars on our blog. Um, we have a tag, a webinar tag, so if you missed one, uh, you can always go back and, and watch the full video. And this is a list of some other resources that will also be available on our blog. Um, so there's a wrap-up blog post, which has a lot more information about the conference. Um, this wiki page has a list of all the slides and the videos that have been contributed from the conference. Um, the YouTube channel has pretty much all of the talks are now up on YouTube, and you can watch the full-length talk. Uh, the corporate working group um, is on the wiki at that URL, the Slack community. Uh, you can can get an invite to that if you're not already part of the Slack community by clicking on that link. And then the, the corporate working group mailing list is available um, on that URL. So with that, um, we'd like to open it up for questions. All right, great. Um, and uh, speaking of questions, I just want to mention to people that when you leave the webinar today, there are just two quick questions. We would love if you uh, answered those. Uh, so please do that uh, when you leave. But we've got just a couple minutes left here in this session. We uh, plan to wrap up in 30 minutes total. And uh, so Nate, um, all of the sessions from, or pretty, or virtually all of the sessions from the conference uh, can be viewed online. Yeah, I believe. That's what you were the, saying? Yeah, I believe all the talks, um, the tutorials, unfortunately, were not recorded. So um, they do have the slides from the tutorials, but they didn't have video videographers in the room on Thursday when the tutorials were happening. Okay. So you mentioned about uh, some of the advances in uh, insights analytics. And uh, one of the things that uh, AppSembler has done for some of our uh, customers is we've actually exported a lot of data uh, for them to analyze in third-party tools mm -hmm. uh, because that tracks you know, everything. So um, do you have a sense of like use cases where uh, people could use insights, but still other situations where they might want to be exporting data? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so insights is essentially three parts. Um, it's the, the edX uh, pipeline, it's the edX insights API, and it's the edX insights dashboard. So the pipeline is what takes the data from the three different sources, um, the MySQL database, which is where most of the student data is stored, the MongoDB database, which is where most of the course data is stored, and then the tracking logs, which you record every mouse click and every, every interaction the student has with the system is tracked in just raw log files. So what the pipeline does is it takes all three of those data sources and it mashes them all together, sends them up to Hadoop um, to, gen to run queries, um, and spits back useful data. And then that data can then be accessed through the edX analytics API. And that's essentially what the edX insights dashboard uses to render all those graphs and charts and downloadable CSV files. So if you wanted to, you could just skip the last step, the, the edX insights dashboard, and you could just query the API directly to pull out the data that you want 
um, for your your dashboard. If you wanted to build your own dashboard or you want to pull this into Tableau or Power BI or Excel, um, you could just query the API for the data that you want and, and do whatever you want with it on, on your side. Um, so the, the dashboard is just a convenient um, way to look at that data, but it's just using the same API that you could query yourself if you wanted to do it that way. Okay. And we've helped some companies uh, set that up and do that. Um, so in terms of the corporate working group, is that going to be uh, meeting on a regular basis uh, online? Is it going to be all done through Slack? Or how do you think it's, it's going to work? Is there someone who's leading it or organizing it? Yeah, so the, the way that we, so we, we talked with the Open edX team at edX about the working groups and, and how they see them running. And there's already an adaptive learning working group. Um, there's an interoperability you know, campus applications working group. And what they found is that um, having a meeting um, to talk about something very broad is, is challenging. So what they're, what they're using is the working groups more to discuss topics of interest and then having people kind of break off to work on like very discrete um, things that they want to improve in, with open edX, right? So um, if you take interoperability, for example, that's a pretty broad category. You could have a few people um, that are really interested in L you know, making open edX the best LTI provider and they can break off and just work on that and then report their findings back to the working group. So the idea is, you know, you have a, a general forum where you can discuss about all the different things that you, that things of interest and then have smaller groups that can actually, you know, work a lot faster and, and really dig in and, um, and identify areas for improvement or in many cases actually write code to make those improvements. Um, so it remains to be seen how we're going to operate the corporate working group, but I, I suspect that it'll be a similar model just because the needs of corporate learning is so broad um, that we'll probably need to break it up into smaller groups. So if anyone is on the call and has an interest in joining the cor corporate working group, and um, if you have particular needs or things, pain points that you've, you've identified, um, chances are there's other people out there who have those same pain points, and they would probably love to talk with you and, and you know, put your heads together and try to figure out a solution. Um, and F-Sembler, as you know, a company that is serving a lot of corporate customers, you know, we're, we're, we're very much invested in this and, and want to work with people to try to solve these problems. So please reach out if, if there are particular things that, uh, that you'd like to improve and we can see what we can do to work together. Um, okay, so, you know, we're out of time here. Uh, we do have some other questions that have come up uh, that we can't get to, but uh, what we want to do is uh, respond to you all offline if we... Uh, haven't been able to respond to you in, in this session. And, uh, you know, happy to do that, and, and we'll get back to you uh, really in just the next few minutes. We'll also send you the links to uh, the materials that uh, Nate was mentioning. And uh, when, please do join us uh, in September on the next webinar about eucalyptus and answer those two quick questions uh, as you um, leave today. So thank you very much, and enjoy uh, August. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nate.